Hi, everybody. Happy snow. Uh, if you're here, your work connects more families and businesses to better broadband. And we want to say at minimum, thank you for doing that. And for making time for Mountain Connect 2022, especially in the snow and crazy weather. And I want to say a quick thank you to Jeff Klavinsky, you know, who's convened this gathering for 12 years now uh, as a way of giving back to the industry that's given him so much. And yeah, Jeff. <clears throat> And to Douglas Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide author and Jeff's new co-organizer uh, for helping to get this year's event ready. And to both for letting me wear a trucker hat in front of Broadband's best and brightest with, you know, against their professional advice. So thanks you all for your patience. And you know, uh, you're not here to see me, you're here to see the man with the plan, Mr. Alan Davidson. But I wanna say quickly, you know, welcome to the post nofo glow. You know, it's a few days since the NTIA just dropped the largest and most impactful document in the history of broadband, right? And it's month before our nation's largest ever investment in public broadband is going to uh, start flowing into states and projects. And that's really exciting. And there's just one thing to know about that, that everything about the last mile just changed, right? And there will be winners and there will be losers. And from our early teardowns of the NOFO, it looks like incumbent monopolies should be worried. Right, which is what we're really excited about is local broadband winning. You know, so with tools like local coordination and challenge process that works for communities, NTIA built a powerful toolkit for local partnerships that want to rise up and get their share of the billions of dollars for broadband. So uh, broadband money is really honored, you know, to present this year's conference keynote, which is Alan Davidson, NTIA's head. And it's really hard to picture a better person to address this room full of top broadband policymakers, advocates, investors, builders. You know, thank you all for what you do. And uh, as a nation, I think that we're lucky to have Alan at the helm of the hardworking NTIA as they're starting to work, you know, with states to smartly and quickly deploy tens of billions of dollars into uh, broadband. And Alan gets that cross-sector collaboration is, is a key to maximizing return on public investment, you know. And, you know, he's not afraid of the administration's 100% access mandate. And then NOFO shows that he intends to work with his team to get the job done, so that's super cool. And his fireside chat's gonna be hosted in a few minutes by Drew Clark of Broadband Breakfast, uh, who works tirelessly towards his mantra of better broadband, better lives, and is an all around great dude. If you don't know him, you should. But for providers and communities who wanna get a quick head start on competition, I wanna show you a quick preview of uh, the, the Bead Grant Start page that just launched this morning on broadband money. Uh, it's the simplest of, a way to apply for and win your share of bead and to see your territory in all new light with collaborators and community partners. And then it helps you line up funding sources for match capital, which you're going to need up front with your application in this round. So you don't waste time in scores of conversations or find out too late that you don't have this key ingredient. So our job at broadband.money is to help local broadband win. And it's, you know, community networks, co-ops, mom and pops, tribes, we think that all should team up with the, team, the communities they serve and rise up to get their share of the broadband funds. And each of Broadband Money's 650 applicants is unique, but they share the same goal that many of you in the room do, and it's to connect more people to better broadband. And while some are waiting on FCC's fabric softener, others are getting ready now to do your own research, to see your area, to build thoughtful, well-composed application models, not static PDFs. Uh, you know, with many stakeholders and collaborators in an environment together, iterating towards the best possible outcome. You know, so, and it's also a way to answer questions once, not dozens of times, which we know you're busy connecting people, so. Uh, and it's also automating ongoing monitoring, reporting, and performance management so that you can focus on better serving subscribers while complying with NTIA state and local guidelines. There's even turnkey ACP so you can deliver seamless experience for families in need. And we built broadband money to help make the most of our historic public investment as the start page for local partnerships to get their share. The simplest way to get ready. And we asked you to find your path ahead at broadband.money and to stop by this afternoon for uh, demos and ice cream at our booth. Yeah. So I'll shut up. I just want to say that Alan knows that every American deserves a chance, right? That in the remote era, access for all is the bedrock of liberty and justice for all and to build the America that poet laureate and future POTUS Amanda Gorman called benevolent but bold, fierce and free. In her words, we must 
lift our gaze to not what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know that to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. And I want to say thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for all you do, because you know that it's not about billions for broadband. This is about connecting real people to better lives. Thank you, and Alan Davidson and Drew Clark, ladies and gentlemen. Please. Okay. Okay. All right. Alan, welcome. It's so exciting to be here outside of the sweltering uh, heat of Washington. It's definitely outside. And oh. <laughs> into the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the snow of Colorado. Uh, Alan, I understand you uh, wanted to say a couple, a couple words as a welcome uh, to Colorado and to our audience here at Mountain Connect. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Drew, and thank you, Mountain Connect, for, uh, for having us, uh, for hosting this event, uh, for getting this crowd together, and uh, for inviting me to speak here. I'll say this is my first, I think, real major public appearance since, uh, since our big announcement uh, a couple, less than two weeks ago at, uh, at the Department of Commerce at NTIA, launching our Internet for All initiative and our uh, $48 billion in funding to connect everybody in America. Um, I will just say, you know, we've been talking about the digital divide in this country for over 20 years. Uh, finally, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, the leadership of a lot of folks in the uh, House and Senate, you heard Senator Bennett a little while ago, and President Biden, uh, we have the resources to really make structural change, to really address this mission of closing the digital divide. And that's pretty exciting. So we're very, we're very excited at, the, at NTIA to be launching this program, uh, to be doing this work. Um, we've been grateful for the response so far. Like I say, it's been about two weeks. We've heard a lot from stakeholders. We've heard a lot from communities. We've heard from uh, the provider community, uh, which we very much know we need, want to engage with, need to engage with, who are going to actually build this. And um, we've heard from industry, we've heard from a lot of folks, and it's going to take a lot of folks if we're gonna meet this, meet this mission, the mission of connecting everybody in America and closing the digital divide. Um, I will say a key part of this for us is working with states. Uh, the bulk of the money that we're giving out, uh, about $42 billion of it, goes to um, a state grant program. Money will go to the states, the states will do the grant making. Um, the, the starting point for this is uh, the states have to submit letters of intent, indicate their in interest. So far, less than a week into the program, uh, well, I guess a little bit more, uh, we're now um, got 25 states and territories signed up, which is great. And, and, and so we're, the last thing I'll just say is that's going to be a, a critical part of this, and we need people's help to connect, uh, to, to push the states to engage. So we've got 25 states engaged, 35 states who've signed up and said that they're, they're gonna be in here, states and territories, and so this is a big deal for us. Um, the last thing I just say is, you know, for us this is, this is part of a big mission, and I know a lot of you care about this too. Um, generations before us brought water, brought electricity to rural America, built the interstate highway system, we really feel that this is this generation's infrastructure project to build. Our infrastructure project to build is connecting everybody with the digital world. And uh, I really believe that when we look back 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we will see this as a moment where our generation stepped up in the way that prior generations did and worked to make sure that everybody had access and the ability to thrive in the new modern economy that we're building. So I'm super excited to be here with you all, and uh, thank you, Drew. Well, we can just applaud and go home. Let's, there you uh, go. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, that, that, is, that is important, important to start with that end goal in mind. Like, where do we want to be? How do we want to have seen this program looking in the rearview mirror? And when we were last together, Alan, at uh, Broadband Breakfast for Lunch, uh, uh, you, you said that we're not, the Biden administration is not going to be happy until every American has 100 megabits down and 20 megabits up broadband, which is the underserved definition in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And whenever, whenever I have a chance to interview someone like you, Alan, the, the big question is, okay, big picture, 
or details, big picture or details. And we talked a lot, and I'm sure we will talk some more about big picture, but there's a lot of people here who want to know some of those details. So I do want to kind of drill in a little bit to that. And let me just start off with what you said just now, that 25 states have submitted their letter of intent, 34, 35 have said they're going to submit their letters of intent. What about that remaining 15? Like, like I know it's only been two, less than two weeks, but are there any states out there that are not like ramping and rushing to put in the paperwork to get part of this program? So I say, just as a starting point, our goal is every state and every territory, right? I mean, our, our mission, the mission that we've been given, is to make sure that everybody in America has the ability to connect to high-speed, affordable internet access. We can only do that if we've got every state and territory on board. So this launch that we had two weeks ago is really just the starting gun for us. It's launching these programs, and now the key is to get the states on board. Uh, we're very pleased, honestly. I, this was better than we thought it would be, to be honest, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's some paperwork involved. Their states have to figure out who their person is and how they do this letter of intent. We've got a, a hopefully very, we've tried to make it super easy for them. Uh, we know that there are some states that are further along than other states. We just heard from uh, your state broadband leader here in Colorado, uh, folks, uh, who's great. And uh, we're not worried about Colorado. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but we know that there are other states that are further behind. And, um, uh, and we're going to be working with them. So probably the biggest and most important thing that we've been doing within NTIA is staffing up to support the states and to work with the states. So we've built out a state, right. a state team uh, within NTIA. Uh, we're going to have a person assigned to each state. Every state will know who they can call uh, in the federal government at NTIA to make sure that they are doing what they need to do. And there's somebody who's gonna wake up every day and think, how do I make sure Colorado succeeds? How do I make sure Montana succeeds, et cetera. And so we are gonna be pushing. They have till July 18th, we've got time. Uh, but this is this was really the starting gun, and so far we're out of the gate strong. So May 13th was the kickoff, and you also unveiled a new website, Internet for All, right? right? And that that is that designed to be the means for communicating with states, uh, or is that more like a public outreach, or is it trying to do both? It's a it's a little of both, and um, we're hoping it is a public facing. It's designed to talk to spe speak to different audiences. It'll be a place where there are a lot of resources links to webinars, places to get technical assistance, guidance as we put it up, um, connections to other programs in the federal government, because it's not just the programs that we're administering that are going to matter. And we're trying to have one, a one stop where people can go look, just like the tool that we just saw. That was terrific, by the way. Um, you know, I do think that there will be a lot of deep, direct connection to states. We're building uh, a, a, a we're using technology. We've got a, a Salesforce platform for over to share, you know, the details. Uh, states will sign up. There will be ways. We're using, you know, modern customer management technology to make sure that we're keeping in touch with states, not just on this one program that we're talking about, the, the BEAD program, the state grant program, but all the other programs that we're connecting with them on. So, so again, high level, the BEAD program, broad, uh, Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, is the $42.5 billion. We'll talk mostly about that. But you also kind of, ahead of when you needed to, kicked out the Middle Mile Notice of Funding Opportunity and the Digital Equity Act Notice of Funding Opportunity. And you have all those on that Internet for All website. And you're doing the web webinars and at Broadband Breakfast and Broadband.Money. We've been covering those, focusing on those, making sure that all that information is out there. So to drill into the BEAD program, there's a lot of concern that I've been hearing about it's going to take a long time for this money to get out there because of you got to get the five-year plans in, uh, the states have to have their approvals. Could you just walk us through a little bit of the timelines and this concern that it's going to take 12, 15, 18 months for the first money to be out there. Right. Um, well, I think there's a there's a there's a there's a tension between the, our strong desire to get money out there quickly, but also our felt need, our absolute need to do this right. And I think you see that reflected in the law as it was passed. There's a very clear timeline, a structure that's built into the law that says how we're, how we're supposed to do this, and it starts with good maps, right? It, and it, the process is very clear. The FCC's working on mapping. 
and we need to follow those maps, uh, and we will use those maps for our allocation of funding among the states, and ultimately for states to decide where they're going to spend their money themselves. The good news is it's not like we just have to wait for this and there's nothing else happening. Um, as I said, this is sort of the starting gun for us on a number of programs. We're launching a middle mile program. That middle mile program, well, that grant making is going to happen much more quickly. It's going to start this year uh, where we're going to be starting to accept grant uh, applications. You'll be hearing more about that. And it's actually, whether by accident or by design, it's the right approach, right? Mm -hmm. We'll be doing our middle mile work first. That will then hopefully be, a, the idea is that's a force multiplier for our last mile work that we'll be funding through BEAD. You'll see digital equity planning grants rolling out. We have a set of other monies from other places, uh, from pr prior bills, um, including tribal funding that you're gonna see, um, our con Connected Minority Communities grants. So there's a lot of grant making that you will see even in the short run. And there are other parts of the government. The FCC's got its RDOF, Rural Development Fund. Right. Treasury has got it fun. We're trying to pull these things all together. So even as we are waiting to make sure we do the state grant, that big state grant program the right way, you'll see a lot of other money going out the door. Oh, and that's a great point, connecting these other grants, making sure they are part, of, uh, part and parcel of the process. Let's talk a little bit about the, the state role and how much, this is something we talked about a right. month ago, how much flexibility states would have. So what's, what's your, your view on how you came out? Do, do you right. feel states have enough flexibility or do they really need to kind of hearken to all these rules that you've laid out? Well, again, the starting point for us was the idea that not every state is, is built the same way, that the needs of different states are going to be different. We know that you know, the needs of Rhode Island are really different than the needs of Colorado or Montana or Alaska. And so we wanted to make sure we we're building in a lot of flexibility in, the sta in this for the states to meet the, their needs. Um, at the same time, we did feel like there was a baseline of rules. If we're spending $42 billion of federal money, you can be sure we need to make sure there's some real accountability there. There are real requirements on subgrantees. We also had certain values that Congress put into the statute. We want to welcome new entrants and make sure that, there's a, there's, that new entrants are able to join. We care about affordability, so you see in the NOFO some basic requirements. We left flexibility in there for states to meet these requirements in different ways, and so we do expect that states will take different, different states will take different approaches, but there are some baseline values that are in there that we're gonna expect from everybody. Well, and let's talk a little bit about that. What, what is the baseline value of affordability? How does that get reflected in right. the NOFO? That's a great, so I think from the beginning, we have recognized that affordability is a key part of it. The president himself has talked about this just even two weeks ago right. in the Rose Garden. With that announcement that, that all of these Big companies are going to be part of the Affordable Connectivity Program and, and what else, Alan? Exactly. Well, right, and I think just speaking to the notion that affordability is a key piece of this, you can't, you know, we could have a connection going past somebody's house that doesn't do them any good if they can't afford it to get online, mm -hmm. right? So this has been a, Congress recognized this, the president recognized this, in uh, the, the announcements that we made, we made it clear, uh, and particularly in this, in this bead program, um, probably three different things. One, every provider's gotta have a low cost option. States will define that differently. We gave in a good, uh, some examples in the NOFA of what that could look like, but there has to be a low cost option for low income Americans. Mm -hmm. We also say that states have to demonstrate afford an approach to affordability. So how are we gonna make sure that there's affordability built into these plans in other ways. And the last is we made affordability a key part of the prioritization criteria that states need to use when they do competitive grant making. So um, there are a bunch of different criteria that states are required to use, but we wanted to make sure that affordability was part of it so that making that, that, that when grants are made, there's an eye towards uh, not just the cost to the government, but also making sure that long term there'll be a guarantee of some affordability. Well, on, on the other hand of this, you know, good right. rules and good prescriptions, you have the sense of overly prescription or overly rules. Right. And there are people who are saying there's a lot of rules in this NOFO. And I mean, just let me just highlight one, the letter of credit uh, requirement. Uh, many people say that that's, you know, an unnecessary uh, uh, imposition to put in there. What, what's your response to that, Alan? Well, I mean, we did um, look at some of our past experience uh, in grant making, looked at how others do. I think part of the issue in here, again, it comes back to we want flexibility, we want to welcome new entrants, 
but we also need to make sure uh, you know, that federal money is being spent wisely. And we have heard stories in the past and had experiences in the past where it hasn't been. So we are here to make sure that there's gonna be proper oversight and accountability. Now, we're very open-minded about feedback here. If we've gone some, in some direction here, that this is, not the end of the, this is not the end of the story, right? So if there are particular requirements that we've put in that, we, that folks find to be particularly problematic, we wanna hear that. Um, but I will say, you know, I, there was a lot of work that went into uh, the, the, those requirements, and I will say we pushed ourselves to make sure that we were making things as easy uh, and as friendly to new entrants as possible while making sure that we're taking care of taxpayer dollars. When you say it's not the end of the story, what, what does that mean? This is a final rule, is it not? This is the first, this is our notice of funding and it basically lays out the basic requirements. There are a lot of things that are not included in here. Mm -hmm. We actually made a, for those who've looked at these documents, they're like 50, 100 page documents. They're long documents. They've got a lot of federal lang bureaucratic language in them. Uh, so you, this will sound funny, but we actually tried to make them as short as we could. Um, and um, we did that yeah, by- Below 100 pages, 98 pages is not- 98 pages, below 100 pages, I'd love to say. I, we had hoped it would be shorter, but there's a lot that, there was a lot to say. Even so, we tried to take the principle, if it didn't need to be in this notice, it's not there, right? And so we've, you know, there are other issues, supply chain issues, workforce issues, um, where we will be offering future guidance and also looking for future input on them. And so um, uh, not everything is in this notice. So we anticipate an ongoing process of technical assistance with states, with providers, with communities. We expect that there will be um, further guidance that's gonna come out. Okay. On some of these issues. Um, can, can you address another specific one? Will it require congressional action to pr prevent the IIJA uh, funds from being taxable income to commercial uh, grantees? How do you see this issue resolving itself? That is a big issue. We know that this is a big issue for, for providers, for everybody. I mean, we would like to make sure that these dollars, from our own selfish point of view, <laughs> of try, our mission is to connect everybody and some level, $42 billion doesn't go as far as it used to. I don't know. <laughs> um, we want to make sure it, it, it goes as far as it can. And so we're keenly aware of this issue about taxation. Um, I would just say it's, it's an issue of ongoing conversation within the administration. It's not something that would be addressed in these notices, but I'll just say that's an area where you could expect to hear and see more. Uh, there's a lot of energy going into what, making What about that out. What about Buy American provisions? Yep. Uh, obviously, th there is a law right. on this subject, but there's also a waiver process. So could you just talk about the balance there when it's just going to be hard to get 55% of yeah. your fiber made in the United States? Right. So that's another great example of an area where you can expect to see f future guidance, more interest. There are very clear Buy America provisions in the, in the statute. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we mentioned, we acknowledge them. Um, I will just say we, we, will we, have, we have to, we will be following those requirements. And part of that is for a very good reason, which is part of the hope of a, of a statute like this, of an initiative like this, is to promote jobs in America, to promote manufacturing in America. And um, I think Congress very intentionally put those provisions in there to do that. I think Senator Bennett alluded to that as well. At the same time, we're clear-eyed about the challenges that are gonna be ahead. We've heard about them from, from many providers. Uh, we know that it's hard, that telecommunications networks are going to be, uh, present unique challenges um, in this. And so all I can say is we're gonna be following these provisions. The provisions allow for waivers. The bar will be high on those waivers, but we expect that there will be waivers. But we, we certainly want to get good questions. We're going to turn to the audience here, and we also have online questions. I've been asking some of those, and if, if you have other questions uh, and, and want to ask, please, please do so. But, but Alan, let me, let's come back to this, this core issue of, of the technologies that are going to be used and how they're going to be deployed to reach certain areas. So obviously there's, there's areas of the country that meet the... the that, let's put it the other way. They do not meet the served, th the, the th served threshold that are not 25 by three. And those are obviously crucial areas. But you also seem to, in the NOFU, give uh, similar treatment to the 100 
by 20 areas, the underserved areas. Could you just talk a little bit more, and we obviously we, we, we started this conversation some weeks ago about how a project is going to incorporate areas that may have like a small cable provision, uh, cable plant that, that might meet the serve definition but doesn't meet the underserved definition. How is that gonna roll out? How do you see a kind of a project uh, coming yeah. in and, and meeting these definitions? You know, I'm not sure that we treat these kind of classes of projects exactly the same. I mean, the statute, again, that we've been given, the law that Congress passed is pretty clear. It's focused on making sure that the unserved, defined as those under 25.3, are, are, are addressed first, right? And then for states who can show that they've addressed that, they can use the money to address the underserved, those under 103. And then there's other opportunities to use the money for uh, community anchor institutions, other um, non-deployment activities. I think that the way we've written this is designed to show that yes, the priority has to be, continues to be, making sure that we serve all of the unserved first. But we recognize the practicalities of this for a state that's doing a grant making process. And for states that can show, that can demonstrate in their plans that they are easily going to reach, that they are going to reach all the unserved, they can, in their grant making, do grant making for the underserved as well. And if we feel that we've been satisfied that they, so there's not a temporal requirement, right? You don't have to do all the unserved. Then when you're done with all the unserved years later, go to the underserved. Th that is a great point, Alan, and just, I mean, just to underscore that, because I think sometimes Congress gets this mindset, oh no, everything's gonna get done 25-3, and right. then we, but you're basically saying, doesn't need to be in that time period. You can have a plan that covers everyone right. that doesn't meet the underserved definition. Absolutely, and I think, we, again, we're just trying to be really pragmatic about how this is gonna roll out and how we can make it roll out effectively and well for states. And so, yes, the notion that we would do all the grant making and, and build out all of the 25, three unserved, and then come back years later and do the underserved, just did not seem practicable or the intent of Congress. So the, I think the statute's pretty clear. For the states need to demonstrate, and we will hold them to this, that they're gonna reach all the unserved. But we know, our modeling, we know, we expect that there'll be plenty of states that are gonna, with the money they've been given, have no trouble reaching all the unserved. And so we wanna make sure we give them the opportunity to do these other things, including reaching out to the underserved. And the other thing is, we know that for providers, practically speaking, you know, we, don't, we want them to be able to have economically effective projects, projects that are gonna survive economically over time. And for many of them, that will mean serving unserved and underserved together. As long as there's demonstrated, we, we know that unserved is met, we will allow states to move forward with those plans. Well, I have more questions, but I don't want to hog the time. Uh, our, our host for the event, uh, Jeff Gavinsky, is over here. Jeff, you have a question for Alan. Go for it. Yes, sir. So before I ask my question, I thought I'd give you a little bit of history. So this conference actually started um, in response to the ARA funds that the state of Colorado received in 2009. And I, I think you could argue that one of the issues and challenges with the, the, the overall project itself was the lack of oversight. So my question to you is, how do we make sure the money goes where it needs to go? And how, what, is, what, are the, um, the, what is the foundation of oversight? So it's great, a great point about oversight. It's a great, it's a great point. It's a great question. And, and we've tried and we will be building in oversight both at the federal level and requiring it at the state level, right? So the starting point for us is that oversight is essential. We are stewards of the federal, of federal money, taxpayer dollars here. Again, I also go back to, we will not meet our mission. We will not be able to connect everybody if the money is wasted. So we have a keen interest in making sure that there's strong oversight about how the money is spent. We do that in a couple of different ways. The biggest hook for us is the approval of these state plans. And we will be looking to these state plans. We will hold states' to, feet to the fire on making sure that there are real accountability mechanisms built in. We spell out some of those accountability requirements that we expect to see in, the, in these notices that we've put out. And the last thing I'll say is transparency. I think we believe that transparency is a critical piece. They say sunlight is the best disinfectant. 
and we will be transparent about how we approach this. We expect states to be transparent about their planning and about their requirements and about where grant money is going. And I think this is a key lesson that we've all learned uh, over the last decade. Let's keep the conversation going, but let me invite uh, questioners to come. I, I see we have them here. So let's go ahead and uh, turn to Sean Gonsalves of uh, Muni Networks. Hi, uh, Sean Gonsalves, excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you for being here of Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Question, um, and I know there's some specific language in the NOFO as it relates to um, grant access for, for municipalities and such. Our organization and a handful of others track, among other things, track which states have preemption laws that prevent or have erect barriers to municipal broadband, et cetera. My question is, those states that have those preemption laws on the books, do they risk not being able to participate in the BEAD program with, with, with those laws without specifically waiving some of those, th those laws? Or it, so how, how will uh, NTIA view those? Thank you. Yeah. We addressed this to some extent in our notice. So the, the, the key principle here is we want to make sure that, that this, these programs are inclusive. And in fact, the law says that the programs must allow a wide variety of potential providers, lots of different models, community networks, nonprofits, um, rural cooperatives, right? The statute actually says they can't be, they can't be prohibited. Um, we echo that in our, our notice and we also know, and I will just say that in, you know, in many circumstances, these varieties of different providers have been incredibly important. There's a lot of data that shows that, for example, especially in these unserved areas, especially in these hard to reach places, you know, municipalities can play a very, very critical role. You know, so, yeah, that's, and so, no, no, that's it. So we, we, we address that in the notice. We are gonna press states to, to make sure that they're doing all that they can do under their laws to make, to be including those. Well, it's worth spells. calling out what you actually say in the, the NOFO on page 50 and 51. You say that uh, for those- Drew comes very prepared if people, <laughs> if, yeah, for, for those who haven't sat with him before, uh, those, this is very typical. <laughs> for those states that do have laws that would preclude it, NTIA, you say, strongly encourages eligible entity states to waive all such laws for purposes of the program. If an eligible entity does not do so, waive those laws, those restrictive laws, the state must identify all such laws in its initial proposal and describe how the laws will be applied in connection with the competition for subgrants. Those are pretty strong words there, Alan. We are doing all we can to lean into the idea that we believe there's gonna be a variety of approaches, that communities play a huge role here, and we're gonna try and do all we can, we can under law. You know, states have their laws. We're gonna try and do all we can under law to pressure states and to make sure that states are transparent where they're not able to meet them. Yeah, wonderful. Question on this over here. Please identify yourself. Uh, yes, Ernie Staten, uh, Fair Long Gig. Good morning, Alan. Um, so I'm going to couple on that question, uh, and I'm going to dive a little deeper into it. The, uh, the middle mile funding that you have proposed, and, and we've seen the, uh, the notice, it's, it goes as far as to say local there, where most of them say most of the funding is under state uh, uh, oversight, but this goes all the way to local. So if your state does not get involved? Will this go all the way to the local in that particular state? So I think that there's... If a state doesn't have a broadband office, is that what you're saying? They have a broadband office, but uh, the, fun, the state of Ohio has definition that excludes municipal broadbands from uh, it getting any funding through the state of Ohio. But under Middle Mile, it, it talks about local government. It most of them have Ohio or have state uh, oversight. The middle mile funding is very specific, goes all the way down to local. So if your state does not uh, want to give to local, can you still go after the NTI yeah, that's funding? That's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. Um, I think what you're saying, there's, there's a couple of different pieces. So this is in the middle mile program. And for those, Correct. the middle mile program, just to review the bidding is, uh, it's a smaller program, it's about a billion dollars. It's a competitive grant program, so this is not, does not go through state broadband offices, right? So unlike the state grant program, the big $42 billion program, we don't give money to the Colorado broad, in that one we give money to the Colorado broadband off, or whoever the governor designates, and the governor and the state will um, ultimately decide how the, right. that money is granted. In the middle mile program, it's a direct grant process. Right. 
And so, but you're raising a really interesting question. We call out that we're gonna be accepting applications from a very wide variety of players, and we expect that, you know, to the extent that it's lawful, we will be hearing, uh, and we expect to receive uh, grant applications yeah. from, those, from those players. Let me just build on that question, and as before we go to our next question over here, about what, what is the role of the staff, that, that you, both right. the historic staff that you've had and the, and the staff right. now. Like, obviously you've had many people work for many years on right. uh, these programs uh, before, you know, kind of the Broadband USA was the former uh, entity yeah. and now the Internet for All. What, what, what do you hope people will take from working with the staff at NTIA? Well, first of all, I'll just say we're very lucky, and I've been so impressed. I've only been on the job a little over four months now, but one of the great, one of the best things about my job is the team that we have, and a, that most of whom predated me, <laughs> uh, and, and many of whom have been part of the federal government for, for years at a time. Um, uh, they work very hard. This is like, uh, you know, kind of a, for, for those of us who've been toiling in this space, probably a lot of you out there, this is a very unusual moment. I will say um, we've been really lucky again to have great staff. Uh, I hope that people will uh, engage with them. There's a lot of expertise. I'll say we have two staffers here uh, in the room or who'll be here at the conference who I just call out. Um, one is Scott Woods, who's been the head of our first director of our Office of Minority Broadband Initiatives. And he is, am I allowed to say? I think I am. You are. <laughs> He's gonna be leaving us, unfortunately. Uh, but he's been a, a giant in the field, helped stand up this office, uh, not going too far in the space, uh, but Scott's here, and if you see him, um, he's a great person to talk to about a lot of this work, for a lot of our digital equity, all of this work he's been a big part of. Um, Sarah Blue is also gonna be speaking here later today, and I, she's, she's gonna be the manager of our Middle Mile program for, some, for specific questions on Middle Mile, I'd hit her up. Uh, I'm also joined by Sarah Morris, who's my senior advisor, uh, at NTIA on broadband issues. So all of us are here, and the idea is we're here to be a resource, you know, and we know we may not have gotten everything right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We know there's actually a lot of more work to do here, so we really welcome your feedback. Well, and let's give a round of applause to the NTIA staff. Yes. I will say, we, this staff has been, this team has been working incredibly hard the last, since the passage of this bill. Uh, I know six months sounds like a long time to stand up these programs, but I can tell you in federal government time, that is like light years, and the amount of work that went into putting these giant notices together in a really thoughtful way, doing the outreach, listening to all the feedback, over six, almost 600 comments we got in the public record, just a huge amount of work. So uh, this is a big milestone for us, and of course, like I say, it's just the starting gun too. We still have a little more time. We've got about 10 more minutes, so if you've got questions, go to the Q microphones. Let's turn to Gary Bolton of Fiber Broadband. Hey, Alan, I'm Gary Bolton, CEO of Fiber Broadband Association. And first of all, thank you for your leadership. Um, your staff has amazing, Doug Kinkoff and the whole team has been really um, yeah. great. I also I want to congratulate you on the NOFO was actually very masterful in the way that you mitigated a lot of issue, redlining issues like with uh, LEO satellites and things like that that really were going to cause a lot of issues. So I thought that you were very instructive without being too over prescriptive. I thought you'd had the right balance, so thank you for that. Thank I just wanted to <laughs> just make a clarification on something that Drew said earlier, just to, as we represent the fiber industry, um, there was a comment about um, Buy America. The fiber industry, we have um, plenty of domestic supply of fiber. Matter of fact, we um, actually exported 34% of our supply last year. And so from a Buy America plan, there's no, no reason not to buy domestic uh, fiber. The issue is more on the electronic side where you're putting a lot of parts together that are globally sourced. So I just wanted to make that clarification just so that you don't leave here thinking that someone needs to buy China from anybody other than a, a domestic supplier. Well, well, thanks for the clarification. Let me, let me ask the first part of what he said about satellite broadband. Have you heard much from people about your declarations that satellite broadband is not reliable and you're basically not gonna give any funding of this 42 billion to satellite? So, um, Starting point, let me just, first of all, just say thank you for the question and the clarification. I think it's well, you know, it's well understood, and this is exactly why we do need to look carefully, and we will be have put, putting in place a waiver process that's very careful about where the real, where the real sticking points are. And we know that there are gonna be some, 
And so, and we've heard from the uh, fiber industry directly about some of this. So we're gonna be watching capacity and we're gonna be looking at this and we're eager to hear about your pain points. I would just say to everybody in the room. So um, on this issue, you know, I think that may be an overstatement. I don't think that there will be no money going to satellite. Um, I believe, you know, our expectation is that in some states, um, that will be, it will be an important part of the okay. solution. State by state. So state by back state. to laboratories of democracy, different yep. states can do different. Some states will be much right. more fiber focused. Other yep. states will have a fiber right. terrestrial mix. Yes, and we, look, there's, we, it goes back to um, this overarching value of making sure that we're doing this right mm -hmm. and we're doing this uh, in a way that is resilient to future needs. And you heard, I think, again, I struck by Senator Bennett's comments earlier today about wanting to make sure that we're not wasting this money. I think all of us feel very strongly who've been building this program in the federal government. We, this is our shot. We do not want to, we will not be able to go back to Congress five years from now or 10 years from now and say, oops, you know, we didn't really build it in a way that works anymore. We need to, you know, we need more money to upgrade speeds or to, you know, build a different kind of network now. This is an infrastructure project. It's designed to last for years. And, you know, we do put our thumb on the scale on, on the most resilient, future-proof technologies that we can, knowing that they are still going to be in the, this is the balance you talked about, like, that there has to be an escape valve for states, that for the high, really high-cost areas, we fully expect that states will, that there will be states who will have significant portions of other technologies. Okay. No, thanks for that clarification. We have another question over here. Aaron Deacon with Casey Digital Drive. Um, a general question about how uh, you can navigate between potential conflicts between funding sources with a specific example in Missouri, um, the, uh, the, there was a $42 million NTIA broadband infrastructure program grant that was awarded in March, which I think covers 12 counties, maybe 13,000 individuals, uh, and the projects were selected, at, there were a few in the, in the boot heel that were, um, you know, two year turnaround time, commitment to serve every household in the geographic area, and I think they, they may have been fiber. And it turns out after these were awarded, they found out that there were ARDOF awards uh, from the FCC's program that were made, uh, that had a six year timeline. Uh, the proposals were cherry picking some of the best customers in the area, and the, the technology wasn't as good. And so the state's kind of struggling with, and, and what I understand is they've been told, well, you, you know, the, the FCC wins this battle, and so, you know, do, does the community lose? I, you don't need to necessarily address that specific one, although <laughs> would love would love suggestions, but, but I'm curious how you kind of navigate those tensions through this process. Yeah, it's a terrific question. I think our um, starting point in our commitment and what we've been asked by Congress to make sure that we are using federal funds wisely and we're not duplicating where we're going. As you've indicated, you know, and I do think this is kind of an edge case, but there are edge cases and we're aware of them where, um, uh, where, where unbeknownst to, to different agencies, awards have some overlap. Um, and what we've done then after the fact is to deconflict those overlaps. And sometimes that, you know, doesn't, is, isn't what the local community wants. You know, our, our grants actually move out faster than those RDOF grants, so we <laughs> consider them to be better grants to, for somebody to get, but we have stuck by that principle that we're not gonna, double, we're not gonna allow for d double funding. And um, so we're working very hard. It takes a lot of work to make sure we're doing that deconfliction. This is where better data, by the way, and better maps are gonna help us a ton in the future. But even as we work towards that better future, we're deconflicting so, so and making sure we don't do that. I mean, you, you kind of referred to the RDOF long process right. of, uh, you know, this was two years ago, they were bid on and, and you know, right. they haven't been awarded money on the street yet. Uh, did you just say that RDOF areas will not be eligible, or could you just clarify how, how those are going to get yeah. handled? So I would just say it's complicated, and the only reason I say that is because there's lots of diff there's different levels of RDOF awards for those who geek out on this stuff, right. and um, and we geek out. And on you this do stuff, here, right? I know. But, uh, so, <laughs> um, but like for awards that are already granted. Yeah. you know, that are fully granted, right? I guess they're, and I'm not gonna get the terminology right. There are awards that the FCC has still not finalized, right? And for those awards, we do think that, you know, other grant makers in the federal government ought to be able to make grants in those spaces. 
uh, and then it should be up to the FCC to decide uh, to de-conflict. Uh, but for where those con funds are contractually obligated, and I'm not gonna get these terms right, so forgive me, but uh, those who know, know what I'm, hopefully know what I'm talking about. Uh, there are gradations where we are gonna make sure we deconflict. Okay, we're, we're running tight, but I, I like to err on the side of getting questions in. So, by 840, okay, well, great. Then let's, let's do them still, please be brief, one at a time. Go ahead. Hi, Lai Olson from Measurement Lab. Um, I also have a, a geeky question. Also, everyone else who uses this mic is taller than me. Um, <laughs> uh, Probably moves. Yeah, on the topic of mapping, um, I mean, there's an ongoing conversation um, in the internet measurement community about maybe the, over, the potential overemphasis on speed and throughput bandwidth. Um, and I was wondering how NTIA was thinking about other metrics such as latency, buffer flow, responsiveness, um, and was just curious if you could talk about that. Great so question. it is a great question, and um, we've tried to add some of that into uh, our notice and our approach to this. There's a requirement around latency. Uh, again, we we heard about this from uh, in the comments that we received, and so we've tried to address that. There are other areas we have some looser metrics and desires around um, reliability and resiliency. And I think there's an opportunity to continue that conversation. So I just say we welcome more input on this. And I'm gonna go quick, quicker here because I know we have- Well, but, but uh, again, yeah. our, our balance is between getting the right answer versus getting all of the right. questions in. Is the 100 by 20 and 25 by three, are those actual speeds or like promised speeds? Could you address that question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're designed to be actual speeds, but the question of like, what does that mean? Yeah. Is a real is, a, is an interesting question and one I think that we need to continue to dig into as we know and we and we certainly will okay two more here go ahead thanks Drew uh, my name is Lori Adams I'm the senior director of broadband policy and funding strategy for Nokia uh, sticking with the mapping issue for a moment I just could you talk a little bit about what you're anticipating the coordination between NTIA and FCC will be on the mapping data because obviously the the fabric that the FCC is working on is is going to be the single point of truth for all of these things, the NOFO uh, asked the states to develop their own location-specific maps. And so could you just talk for a moment about what that is going to look like in terms of the states um, being able to provide that information in a timely fashion to the FCC for inclusion in the data maps? So I think you're 100% correct. I mean, the FCC maps really need to be, uh, we are mandated by law to use those maps and to make them the source of truth here. There is a process that the FCC has, and it's complicated, and it's part of what is tricky about the timelines, right? Which is that um, the FCC is gonna be co is collecting data this summer, and they'll be putting out uh, that data in the fall, and they'll be opening it up for input and challenge from states. And so um, we're eager, and we're, I will just say, we are working directly and very closely with the FCC now on this issue. Um, our staffs are meeting, we are in touch regularly. I mean, we have a, a joint team of folks who are working on this. We talk a lot about it within the administration because we know it's a gating item. I'll just say I think the FCC chairwoman has indicated she's incredibly committed to putting resources into making sure that this happens fast. And I think your, your question just sort of, you know, kind of raises the point about how important it's gonna be to get these maps right. They're essential. We've made this error before, <laughs> right? which is to rely on maps like that are at the census block level or just not granular enough. These maps will be much better. It will take time to get them to be that, to that much better place. They'll always be kind of a um, approaching truth. <laughs> right. You know, it's like asymptotically getting closer to the true state of what's happening out there. The best thing I would just say to everybody who's listening is for those of you who are providers or people who have to put data into this system, we're really, asking everybody to get their data into the FCC as quickly as possible, asking all providers, because that is gonna be essential. The faster they get the data, the faster they can clean it up, turn it around, and make sure that we've got good maps for everybody to use. All right, penultimate question, then I have the final one, so go <laughs> ahead. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name's Colleen McCroskey. I'm a telecommunications attorney in Denver at a firm called Kissinger and Fellman, a general counsel for the Colorado Communications and Utility Alliance. I know we've talked a little bit about preemption, and I was very heartened to see that the NOFO strongly encourages uh, the waiver of state laws that would preempt municipal governments from the provision of broadband services. 
I was wondering if the NTIA and its staff has considered what it would do if it gets a proposal from a state that is not willing to waive those state laws. Because on one hand, we have a very clear statement from Congress that states may not exclude local government from these fundings. But on the other hand, it seems like it may not be within the intent of this bill to exclude a state from funding. So I'm wondering if the NTIA has considered what would happen in that situation. I think you, you've raised the issue well, which is to say we have these, um, these interests, uh, which are very important. We strongly believe that there should be the widest possible variety of opportunity to participate in the program. We know that municipal broadband plays an important role, particularly in a lot of unders unserved areas. Um, you see, I think the answer is in our notice, which is you see in there us leaning in as far as we can, leaning in hard on the idea that states really should let those uh, that variety of providers participate. So Alan, it was one of your pre predecessors, Larry Irvine, who coined the term the digital divide. And the digital divide has come to mean lots of different things. In some cases, it's a kind of a Rorschach test for what problems we have with broadband. It can mean you know, the lack of broadband availability in rural areas. It can mean the high cost of broadband that keeps people in inner cities and other communities from having access. It could mean schools that don't have broadband, people who bring their laptops to uh, McDonald's and other places because they don't have it. What are your thoughts, particularly as you've put a marker out there, a very strong marker, we want to end the digital divide. What will that look like? What, is, what does the digital divide mean from a programmatic, let's get rid of it type of Right. Well, I'll just say, I think we have this goal that I think, and it is, it was one of my predecessors who really popularized the term about the digital divide, um, of making sure that there's meaningful adoption and use, that people can participate, that everybody has the opportunity to participate in the modern economy. And we know that that means, you know, more than just making sure there's a connection available, right? A connection in front of, to somebody's home, a wire running past or a wireless connection, if it's not affordable, that doesn't do that person, that family, much good. If the connection's affordable, but they don't have a device to get online, that doesn't help. If they have a device to get online, but they don't know what to do, there are no applications, it doesn't work, in, there's nothing in the language that they speak, they don't understand, you know, they don't have the basic skills, then we haven't met our goal. So we are looking holistically at all of these, and the beauty of, the, of what Congress, I think, did in this, in this infrastructure bill and in the other programs they've passed is given us and our other and others around the federal government tools to address this together. We've been talking about a bunch of different programs that NTIA is administering. This big state grant program, uh, our digital equity program, our middle mile program. We have a really big uh, tribal opportunity program. We think about braiding these programs together. And the notion is that they reinforce each other and they reinforce the programs like the affordable connectivity program that the FCC is running, the treasury money that's being out there, the rural development fund, the agriculture programs. We are together and I sit all the time with the other leaders in these programs at other parts of the federal government and we talk about how to braid these programs together towards that long-term goal, um, that big picture goal of making sure that there's meaningful adoption. So. We are working on the ground to pull these pieces together. As I said, our, our strong belief is that we're gonna look back 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and look at this as the moment that our generation took the step to do what generations before us did, which is to make sure that everybody had the economic opportunity that they needed, that we addressed the inequalities and the fairness in our society by making sure that everybody could be part of the modern economy. And for us, that means make meaningful adoption of high speed, affordable, reliable internet. Um, we are gonna need your help. <laughs> really, the only way this works is if everybody, and it's not just the federal government, it's not just the state government, it's local communities, it's providers, it's the workforce that needs to be developed, um, it's people themselves getting online and being part of this and telling their neighbors about it. So I just say thank you. Thank you for being well, part of this movement. Thank you all for being part of this uh, for many years, and thank you for having me here today. This is, a, this is a big historic moment for our country, and we've got a lot of work to do together. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Alan Davidson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.